Pokets to the stage. He is the local artist who has done many, many Pokemon-related installations and performances, and he is here to give us a little bit more context about the Pokemon phenomenon, and here he is. Hello, say hello to Johnny. How's it going? Thanks so much for having me. Uh, a little bit about me, I've done drawings of every single Pokemon, which is probably not as hard as catching every single Pokemon which I think some of you have probably done, considering you're here tonight. I hosted a 24-hour Pokemonathon at USC to raise money for the animal shelter last year. And I did a panel on Pokemon at the Hammer Museum. Uh, so I've been playing Pokemon for as long as it's physically possible. All right. Um, why don't we start with, um, because I am a layman. I am coming to this entire cultural phenomenon from an outsider's perspective, so some of these questions might be a little basic, but bear with me because I'm still learning myself. Um, what about the phenomenon captured your imagination and carried it over to your artist life to make you want to focus on it as a, as a medium? I think it's the sense of adventure in Pokemon that draws everyone in, you know, this idea of going out and exploring in nature and finding something. That's something that was present in the games in a digital wilderness and now with Pokemon Go is present in real wilderness. And also just the, the way that Pokemon, playing Pokemon is so individual, like you as a trainer are different from every other Pokemon trainer in terms of the Pokemon you want to use, how you want to battle, and so that manifested itself in tournaments I would throw, where punk bands would play over the battles, and trainers would be in cages, it was sort of like the Warriors, and that uh, was such a fun wish fulfillment for me that I've been making work about Pokemon ever since. Um, how did you feel as someone who'd been thinking about it and recontextualizing it when it suddenly became so popular again, seemingly overnight. Well, I think what's happened in the past month or so is a lot like what happened 20 years ago, only condensed into an even more intense burst, short amount of time. And it's also sort of like, I mean, because this is one of the biggest, if not the biggest video game releases ever, and I don't think Nintendo expected that, but it's, these characters have been building up goodwill for 20 years now. They've been a part of our childhood. It's sort of like Michael Jackson. Sure. It's sort of like the like the album Thriller. Like Michael Jackson had been around doing the Jackson Five like before that, and then he did Thriller and escalated music and celebrity to like a unknown level. That's sort of what Pokemon Go has done for 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 like a single video game, I think. And do you think personally that the experience of playing the card game and the original games carries over into the new experience that most people are interfacing with now? Well, it's a really different game, but it's definitely an evolution of what I was talking about in terms of going out and experience something in, in, in exploration, you know, now it's not digital wilderness, it's an augmented nature, and it makes you think about the physical spaces that we live in uh, way more. Like, you notice things because they're pokey stops. You did, maybe you didn't realize that that statue was of Joan of Arc that was right down the street from you, and you walk by it every day, but now you know, and, and maybe now you're going to places you never went before because you heard that's where all the Charmander are, or something like that. Like, it's, it's affected the way people move, and live in the world. I heard a random conspiracy theorist on a very funny radio show talk about how the company Niantic that produces Pokemon Go has CIA ties and that this is a method sure. of, this is a method of them listening in on the general public in such an exciting new way. Do you think that has any validity or is that just as fanciful as Pokemon itself? Well, I think, sadly, as Edward Snowden so poignantly has pointed out to our culture, the telecoms are already I giving information to the government, so anything that's on our phone is usually pretty much already compromised. If Pokemon Go, I don't really think, can add anything to the degree to which we're already able to be monitored by the U.S. government. Do you fight it, then? Do I fight it? 
Pokemon Go? Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah, I love it. I'm, <laughs> I, the only mecha there are mechanics to the game though that I have problems with, like the leveling, making it harder to catch Pokemon, and also I just wish the combat was a little richer, but the developer said they've only released about 10% of the game that they wanted to release, so who knows what could happen. Do you think the Mad Geniuses, did they have any, do you think they had any forethought about how hard it would make an impact, this game? I don't think that they knew Pokemon Go was going to be as big of a hit as it was. I think if they had, they would have maybe developed the game a little more in terms of some of the character design. Uh, not the character design, but the character customization and uh, and the battle. But in other ways, it's, it's, it's the most insanely developed game of all time because it it is so, the experience of playing the game is so specific to where you live and where you go. And that's what's really amazing about it. What do you know, or what do we know about the original creation of the game and the characters? Because like Super Mar you know, Mario or Tetris, famously, these, these games sometimes have one single person who invents them. Is there a single inventor of Pokemon? The creator of Pokemon is a guy named Satoshi Tajiri, the Japanese uh, version of the anime. The Ash's name is Satoshi in his honor, and Satoshi Tajiri was a guy who was a big cave uh, diver, he was a big hiker, he was a bug collector in Japan, and a lot of the places he liked to go to do bug collecting and, uh, and all that sort of nature stuff got developed uh, into buildings, houses, and he saw that uh, and wanted to create a game for Japanese kids that created that, that sense of adventure in nature. So that's sort of the funny origin of Pokemon, and it's a little sad in a way, but it's cool that it's come full circle now with Pokemon Go forcing you outside and, and, and experiencing nature, whether nature is this, an urban environment or whether it's, it is you know, trees and forests and the ocean. For someone like me who doesn't play the game themselves, when I see people out in the street playing it, and it's very clearly kind of like a body language associated with it that oh, yeah. one can spot, um, how do I clamp down on what might be a natural prejudice to say to those people, what are you doing? How do I com combat that? Be beyond playing the game myself, how do I train myself to not... How do, how do I see this as a just a legitimate form of social exercise? It's a heavy question, I know. Sorry. <laughs> well, I think that the experience of playing the game is so fascinating to me because you end up talking to people that you would never normally talk to, asking questions, oh, where did you where did you catch this? Where did you go? Have you seen anything tonight? And people saying, oh, go down the street and make a left, and there's a Kabutops there, you know? That type of interaction is so uh, unique and special, and. Um, sort of forces you to cross a lot of different lines that we don't normally cross when talking to people. Um, yeah, it's definitely made me more aware of some of the people just in my community. Um, tell us about the performances you've done related to the characters and, and the world. Well, I've just done a lot of sort of intervention stuff at art museums. If you guys go to LACMA, there's a huge installation of lamps there. And so that really inspired me to do an electric type gym type setting tournament over there or the Getty Museum. That museum has a garden that was designed by a guy who was trying to talk to aliens. So it looked a lot like a grass type gym and we had a gym leader tournament over there. And it's just crazy because like 200 people showed up at an art museum with DSs and the museum doesn't know what is going on. And they're just completely sh like, but there's nothing they can do because everyone's just sort of existing in space with these handheld gaming devices. They didn't need anything else to set up. And so it was really great to see uh, art people, art world people, or people who are interested in the arts sort of clashing with this, what would be considered more of a slacker medium, which is video games. When, when was that? Like at the Getty, for example? That was in 2014, around uh, when X and Y came out, and you can probably expect a lot more events like that now when Sun and Moon come out. But what's amazing, since Pokemon Go has been released, I was one of three people I knew doing Pokemon events in LA, and now there are four or five events in a week. So I, I'm almost uh, becoming obsolete in a way.
Do you, are you a Pokemon purist, or are you allowing the phenomenon to take whatever course it might throughout society? I mean, I don't have any control over what's going on. It's just completely insane. But I mean, like, how do you feel about it? Because it's something that's very clearly close to you. You know, you have to kind of get something that was everybody's and then became yours because fewer people are interested in it. Now it's back to being everybody's again. I mean, I don't know. I think I'll still be here when maybe this this craze dies down. I think it's good though because it's made people it's made me think a lot more about physical spaces and like safety in the real world and even like discrimination and stuff like that. Like that was one of the main things uh, that I feel like I got to know people who really live in LA through Pokemon tournaments because anyone um, you know Video games, they seem expensive sometimes when we're like, oh, I gotta drop $50 on this game, but they're really very affordable compared to like, you know, uh, some kind of art education that costs $100,000 or a $20,000 painting. Anyone can afford to play Pokemon, and so it sort of becomes, and video games in general sort of become this very of the people medium. It, before we uh, before we start the show, is there anything that you'd like to say to everybody here to keep in mind while they're watching it? Like maybe some hidden gems in the movie or, or things to think about larger style? Uh, I mean, this movie came out at the tail end of the first wave of the Pokemon craze, right after a really crazy summer of Pokemon trading cards. And, uh, and there's a lot of Pokemon in this movie, besides even you and Mewtwo, like Meryl, Snubble, uh, this was the first time they were ever seen uh, in the show or in any real format, and so that was like really big for hardcore fans, aka like every kid in America at the time. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much all I can think about to contextualize this movie a little bit. Um, is there anything that you're doing that's upcoming Pokemon related that people can go to or see or watch or experience? Uh, I think, uh, nothing set in stone in terms of a date. I'm sure that I will be drawing all the new Pokemon that come out with Sun and Moon and showing them alongside the other 800 and some characters that this insane cartoon bestiary has created now. So yeah, keep an eye out for that. Okay, everybody give Johnny a round of applause. Thanks for coming out. Really, I mean, it, it helps me. That's kind of why I did it, because it helps me understand it. So, um, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the first theatrical Pokemon feature, and then we're going to take a break, and then we're going to watch Pokemon the Movie 2000 after that. And these are, the, because there are kids here, these are the English language dubs, and um, if you want to know more about what Draft House does, uh, our handle Draft House LA works for Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, and if you want to know more about what we're doing email style, we have an email list called Victory, and you can just go to drafthouse.com slash victory and find out more about that. Um, the next event we have coming up in, the, in town is August 20th. We're doing a Jackass Marathon at the Egyptian. We're gonna do Jackass 1 and 2 and 3. Thanks again. Thanks so much.